Most Saturdays at this time, we spend an exciting half hour of adventure and action with America's public hero number one, Hopalong Cassidy. Well, even two-fisted cowboys take summer vacations when they can, and Hoppy is no exception. But Hopalong and Topper will be back with us riding the CBS air trails again one week from tonight, September 22nd. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story... The Sound and the Unsound. You know, in my business, you get to the point where you think you've seen everything. In fact, you get there at least twice a week. This time, I was sure of it. It was 10 o'clock at night, and stretched across my apartment door was the settee that customarily covered the frayed carpet about 10 paces down the hall. And stretched across the settee was a sturdy female in her twilight years. She was sound asleep. Hey. Hey, lady. Hey, lady, come alive. Huh? Oh. Madam, oh. madam, you're, you're sleeping in my doorway. Oh. Oh. oh, evening, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, well, I must have dozed off. What time is it? About ten. May I ask, what's the idea? Oh, ten o'clock, you don't say. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't have slept, I don't suppose, except the light's bad in this hall. Not fit for reading, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, well, I'll speak to the landlady. Now, what well, is... Well, I guess I'd better put this set tea back where it belongs. Uh... I hauled it up to your door so I wouldn't miss you. I can haul it back just fine. Yeah, I know, but you... But you... <laughs> now, then, you remember me, don't you, Mr. Marlowe? Lucille Bellows? Well, Lady I... Lady Parmley's friend, remember? She introduced me to you one day in the supermarket. We all began to talk. Oh, sure, and sure, yeah, the... We had fun, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we sure did. Yeah. Oh, by the way, before I forget it, Homer's gone now, you know. Is he really? Mm-hmm. Four months tomorrow. Thought you'd want to know. Oh, I'd want to know that, sure. Don't really suppose I'd have to bother you if he was still around, but since he isn't, I just came right to you the moment I couldn't stand it any longer. Yeah, well, I'm glad you did. Uh, might as well go into my apartment and talk about it, huh? Well, now, that's mighty nice of you, but we'd save a lot of time if we'd just drive right over to the court now. That way you'd be there when it happens. Drive over to... Be there when it happens. I own that nice little bungalow court just off Fountain and Franklin, you know. Won't take us no time to get there if you've got a car. I've got a car. How did you get here? Walked. Do it every evening. Take a nice, brisk constitutional. Keep an old lady like me in fight and trim. How much do you weigh, Mr. Marlowe? About 190. Why? Bet I can lift you. It just seemed smarter all the way around to drive Lucille Bellows back to her nice little bungalow court. My memory wasn't as vivid as hers. I didn't remember Letty Parmley or our hysterical rendezvous in the supermarket or Homer or even Lucille. But the promise of my usual fee made that unimportant. Of two things I was certain, I'd never forget Lucille again, and she probably could lift me. I was still in the dark about everything else as the two of us entered a bungalow at the far end of the court. It was pure Grand Rapids and spotless. You just take that blue chair, Mr. Marlowe. I think that's the best seat. Leastwise, that's where I'm always sitting when it happens. When what happens? The sounds. Good crime, Antley. Don't tell me I haven't told you about them. Well, you've been so busy telling me about everything else. Yes, but I... this is important. Oh. You see... For the last few nights, I've been hearing these strange sounds coming from Mr. Rogers' bungalow. That's the one right next door. Well, maybe Mr. Rogers is just a little noisy. Huh? Uh, no. The thing is, he isn't even home. Been out of town all week on location. He's one of them grips at the studio. Oh, he lives alone, does he? I should think so. He's a bachelor. I keep thinking him and that Barbara Curtis will get married, but they don't. She comes in every so often, cooks him a nice dinner. Lovely girl, just lovely. He's so handy around the place, you know, always painting. And About the, up, the noises. Mrs. Bellows, what do they sound like? Well, sir, they're just downright strange. Sort of a tapping sound. Thought it was the plumbing there at first. Homer used to be good at fixing the plumbing, and I thought about calling him to check it uh, for wait me. Wait a minute, and then just th a minute, please. Isn't Homer dead? Did I tell you that? 
Uh, well, you said he was gone. Oh, well, perfectly logical if you thought so, Mr. Marlowe. Sometimes I tell folks he's dead and gone. Sometimes I tell them he's sicker than a horse and I got him in a sanitarium. But the plain, bald-faced truth is Homer just up and walked out on me four months ago tomorrow. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Well, you know, sometimes I am, too. Most time I'm not, though. But don't think I don't realize I might be imagining these sounds, Mr. Marlowe. I'm getting along in years and it's just as possible it can be... Th there she goes. What do you make of that? I don't know. Sounds like someone's tapping along the wall. You've got a passkey, I suppose? Sure, I'll wear it right around the neck. Good. Come on, let's go. By George, I wouldn't miss this for the world. You better give me the key. We don't know what we'll run into. Just put me out of your mind, Mr. Marlowe. I'm safe as here as anywhere. Okay, watch it, though. I saw a light in the back. I'm not sure. I'll get the light switch. Right. Hmm. No one in the living room, anyway. That you, Barbara? Great, Scott. That you, Mr. Rogers? This is Bellows. Hello. Thought you was away on location. Well, I just got in town a few minutes ago. Boss needed something for the company. He sent me in to get it. Well, sakes alive. Well, I'm that embarrassed at barging in on you this way. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Clinton Rogers. How do you do, Well, Marlo? I don't blame you for looking confused the way you do, Mr. Rogers. I might just as well face up to it. For the last few nights, I've been hearing some pretty strange tapping sounds coming out of your place here. And I made up my mind I'd call my old friend Mr. Marlowe here to investigate him for me. Oh, I see. Say, what? you don't look too good, Mr. Rogers. Oh, I'm fine. I... Well, we've been working pretty hard. I'm just... Tired, that's all. Well, you see, we heard those tapping sounds a while ago, Mr. Rogers, and then a duller, heavier sound just before we came over. I must say, we didn't hear you come home, Mr. Rogers. Well, I came in the back way. The uh, sounds you heard, Mr. Marlowe, I must have made them. I guess I dropped my suitcases pretty hard. I'm tired, like I said. I hope it didn't bother you. Yeah, but what about the tapping along the wall? I can't imagine what that could have been. I didn't hear it. Mrs. Bellows? Why, Mr. Larry, what on earth? The door was open. I saw you in there. I, I must speak with you, Mrs. Bellows. It's... Well, I simply must speak with you. Well, all right, Mr. Larry. We sure were just thinking of you, Mr. Rogers, when we blew in here unannounced, you know. Sure, sure, I know, Mrs. Bellows, and thanks. Don't mention it. I'll be in my bungalow if you want me, Mr. Marlowe. That's fine, Mrs. Bellows. Well, do you think we ought to take a look around, Rogers? No. No, I don't think so, Mr. Marlowe. Mrs. Bellows could have imagined all those noises, you know. Yeah, she could, but I couldn't. Anyone else got a key to your place here? Why... Barbara uh, Curtis, for instance? Mrs. Bellows told you. Yeah. No, no, but Barbara knows where I keep the extra key outside. But as far as I know, she's out of town, too. Mm. By the way, what studio are you with? Imperial. Uh-huh. Look, Mr. Marlowe, I'm really pretty tired. There's nothing wrong here, I'm sure, so... So it's okay with you if I leave now, huh? Well, I just... It's all right, Rogers. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Bellows tells me you're a pretty handy guy around the house, painting, keeping things fixed up, all that. Yeah, I guess I am. Why? Well, you just probably haven't had time to fix that crack in the plaster there running up from the hall closet. Why, no, no, I haven't. I'll have to get to that soon, too. Mm-hmm. That's been nice seeing you, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, same here. You plan to stay in town? Oh, sure. I'll be in town. All night. There was something eating at Clinton Rogers, something pressing, but he wasn't talking about it, not to me anyway. I knew one thing, he'd never seen that crack in the plaster until I pointed it out to him. It was on the wall next to Lucille Bellow's bungalow, and it was the kind of crack that could be made if someone tapped along the wall looking for something. So much for deduction. I went back to check in and out with Lucille. I, I'm just real sorry, Mr. Marlowe. Maybe it's all been over nothing at all. Well, Mr. Rogers will be home all night, so if you hear anything, just pound on his wall. Well, if he's going to be here, I'll feel better. I really will. Say, how about your friend who called you out of Mr. Rogers' bungalow a while back? Mr. Larry? Yeah. Well, now, he's a nice soul. Not the protective sort a woman usually sets her cap for, but Lord Almighty, I'm strong as an ox, you know. Yes, I know. Of course, I don't think he makes a dime. Mr. Larry's in women's hats, you know. No, but I could have guessed. Just why I'd hold out for a man who could support me, I couldn't tell you. Well, you look as though you've done all right by yourself. Well, I have, matter of fact. Got myself quite a little nest egg. Want me to show it to you? No, no, I'll take your word for it. Hey, wait a minute. 
You don't keep any amount of money here in the house, do you? Sure, I'll keep it in the cigar box, right up in the storage part of that hall closet there. Oh, safest place in the world. Yeah, why well, don't your money? Hmm. Well, I guess it could take it to the bank, maybe tomorrow, if you'd feel better about it. Yeah, you do that. Oh, uh, before I go, are all the bungalows alike? Mm hmm, just alike. All have that storage space in the hall closet. Huh? That's right. A little trap door thing at the top of the closet. It's like a little attic, you know. You stash a lot of stuff up there, if you're of a mind. Yeah, I guess you can. Well, I think I'll go now, Mrs. Bellows. Give me a call tomorrow, will you? Yes, sure will. And I'll have your pay for you then, if that's all right with you. Oh, sure. It's just fine. Good night, Mrs. Bellows. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. And a million thanks. Just a million. My pleasure, Mrs. Bellows. <sighs> oh, Mr. Huh? Marlowe. Oh, Mr. Larry, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, it is. I, uh... Well, I know who you are. I, I, I mean, the Philip Marlowe and all that. And all that. Well, that's good. Now we know each other. Huh? I've really become quite chilled waiting for you to come to Brazil. Is that what you waited to tell me? Certainly not. Confidentially, Mr. Marlowe, I know something that may interest you. Oh. Hmm. I, well, it's quite obvious to me that something's going on around here. Something odd, I mean. Are you closing in on a point? Because I wouldn't want you to get any more chills. Very well, Mr. Marlowe. I'll be brief. But it just may interest you to know that I've seen Homer around here. Quite a bit. In the last few days. <laughs> now, what do you make of that? I don't know. What do you make of it? Well, I don't know. I must say, I thought it would mean something to you. Yeah, well, it might mean more to Lucille. Why don't you just... Trot in and tell her all about it. Well, I will. I'll just do that. And I'm sure I'll never trouble you with any of my ideas again, Mr. Marlowe. Good night. Yeah, well, Lucille's as strong as an ox. Oh, that bed's going to look real good. Hey! <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, CBS Radio puts out the welcome mat for three of its greatest stars tomorrow night. Jack Benny and his gang start the new season. My Friend Irma becomes a regular Sunday feature on CBS Radio. And Tony Martin will rejoin Joe Stafford on the Contented Hour. Be listening for Tony and Irma on most of these same stations and Jack over them all. More than ever before, CBS Radio is the star's address. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe in tonight's story, The Sound and the Unsound. The scream was Lucille's. The shots could have been anybody's. A little bungalow caught came alive as I raced back up the sidewalk to Lucille's bungalow. The lights came on in every unit except one. Clinton Rogers' bungalow was dark. Lucille bolted out of her front door to meet me. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, thank the good Lord you heard me. Where'd the shot come from? Mr. Rogers' bungalow. Here, take my key. Uh, I've got to tend to Mr. Larry. What's with him? Fainted dead away when he heard the shot. Oh. I'll come in as soon as Mr. Larry comes to. Okay. Rogers? Rogers? Where are you? Hey, Rogers? Here. Huh? In the kitchen. Hey, you really caught one, didn't you? Yeah. My shoulder burns like fury. Well, who was it, Rogers? Let's say I did it, huh? All right, what'd you do with the gun? Ate it, of course. Oh, now, look, I'll have to call the police. It'll be a good idea if you tell me what happened. Listen, there's a bottle in the first can that there. Get it, will you? I need a drink. Okay. Uncap it. I don't need any glass. Here you go. <clears throat> oh, it's great. It burns, too. Everything burns. Here, have a drink. Thanks. Well, okay, Rogers. I gotta call him now. Yeah, yeah, okay. First, though, listen. 
Will you call the studio? Yeah, I'll call him after we get you to a hospital. I'll tell him you had an accident. No, no, tell him. I. I quit. Quit? Yeah. What look? No, no, don't, don't argue. Just tell him that. Okay, it's a promise. Now, and listen. Hmm? Tell Barbara to. Tell Barbara to. Yeah, Rogers, tell Barbara what? Tell her. To. I called the emergency hospital in Hollywood, and their ambulance was there in no time. So was a squat little sergeant. Lucille followed him in. I had two hunches that I was keeping to myself for the time being. One, that whoever had shot Clinton Rogers was in his bungalow when he got back from location. That they were there when Lucille and I barged in on him. And two, that they'd left by the back door after they'd plugged him. Even the sergeant could see something of interest in that back door. The screen's been cut through here, see? The way it's cut, the fellow could unhook the screen door, see, and get right at the back door. Yeah, well, that's very good, Sergeant. But tell me, why do you think it was a fella who shot Rogers? Well, it could have been. You don't think it was a dame, do you? It's happened before, you know. Excuse me, gentlemen. I know you're busy finding clues and all that, but don't you think I could clean up this kitchen floor? It's a terrible mess. Don't in... touch nothing. Well, it seems to me that you He could... said don't touch nothing. <laughs> Sergeant will let you tidy up things tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's soon enough. Well, all right. I think I'll go back to Mr. Larry now. He's just undone about this whole thing. I'll be in my place if you want me for anything. I'll say good night for now, anyway. Good night. Good night. Well, I'm satisfied for the time being. I'll give you a lift back to the station, Sergeant. I'd like to check on Rogers at the emergency hospital on the way. Yeah, so would I. If he's in shape, I want to talk to him. <laughs> news from the emergency hospital wasn't too good. They'd taken a slug out of Roger's shoulder at 38. He'd lost a lot of blood and was still out. I left Roger's phone number as the place I could be reached if his condition changed. And before I left, I checked the city directory, which made my next stop a very interesting one. Hey, the studio's closed, mister. You can't get in at this time of night. Are you Homer Bellows? That's right, and I'm the night watchman here. Why? <laughs> well, Clinton Rogers works here at Imperial, too, doesn't he? Uh-huh, but he ain't here. He's in a company that's out on location. Leastwise, I think they're still out. You a friend of his, Homer? Well, you might say so. I know him. You used to live next door to him, didn't you? Yep, I did. Hey, who are you, anyway? Well, I'm a guy who wants to know what you've been doing around Rogers' bungalow recently. Rogers' bungalow? Yeah. I've been doing nothing except passing it on my way to my wife's. What infernal business is it of yours? Well, none, really, but I'm a friend of your wife's. Oh, home, I... you are, are you? Well, if you're such a friend of hers, why don't you ask her what I've been doing around there? Does she know? Does she know? I've been asking her for a divorce since you're so nosy. I want to marry me someone else. Oh, won't she give it to you? Oh, she's agreeable to the divorce, all right. The thing that's holding her up is a settlement. Oh, a settlement. Yep. You see, I lived with that one almost 40 years. I think that entitles me to a nice little wad of her money. Lucille, don't see it that way. Yeah, well, some women have next to no understanding about things like that. But my visit with Homer served its purpose. I went back to Roger's bungalow in case the call should come from the emergency hospital. And this time I wanted a good look at that crack on the wall, in the storage compartment in the hall closet. I kept Lucille's passkey, and this time I didn't bother with the lights. I used the flashlight from my car because I was pretty sure whoever had shot Roger's hadn't found what they were looking for. I just opened the hall closet door when I'd heard it. Someone was unlocking the front door. I moved quickly behind a big chair in the living room. Just tiptoe, Bud. We've got to be quiet. Yeah. But what about lights? We'll, we'll try to make the flashlight do. Okay. But I still don't think there's much of an idea. Oh, I was afraid to come alone, Bud. And I've got to find it before Clint comes back. You could just take my word for it, you know. You wouldn't have to be here at all. I've told you. I can't believe what you've said. I've got to find out for myself. Maybe you'll be sorry if you find out. Maybe so. But at least I'll know then. That little storage place here in the closet is the only place I haven't looked. Do you think this will be enough light? Yeah. But how'll I get up there? I can't.
can't reach that door from here. Oh, well, wait. I'll get the stool from the kitchen. I'll get it. No, no, I've got the flashlight, Bud. I'll... <gasps> oh! Oh, good heavens, Bud. Here in the kitchen. It's blood. Yeah. It sure is. <gasps> Who's that? Hey, you... Don't reach what? for anything, Bud. You're covered. What's happened to Clint? Somebody shot him. Oh, no. He's not dead yet, Miss Curtis. You know my name? Yeah, he mentioned you. I'm Philip Marlowe. Mrs. Bellows called me in on this. Oh. Why don't you put the gun down, mister? I will when I find out a few things. Where is Clint? I want to go there. Police took him to the emergency hospital. Police? But... Yeah, they're going to call me here and tell me how he is. He was still out when I left a while ago. Come on, Bud. You've got to take me there. Why? Yeah, Barbara, sure. I... Yeah, not yet, kids. Not till you, you two tell me what you came to find here tonight. And the other nights you've been here. Other nights? You said a while ago you'd looked every place but the hall closet. But I've never been here at night, not without Clint. Don't talk to him, Barbara. You don't have to. I won't. Mr. Marlowe, you can't keep us here. I have to go to Clint. I have to be with him. I'll get that. And don't forget you're still covered, Buster. Yes? Marlowe? Yes, Sergeant. How's Rogers? He's over the hump okay. They gave him a sedative a while ago. He's out like a light. But he's going to be all right. I see. Did he say anything? Were you able to talk to him? I was able, but he wasn't. Sort of delirious, I guess. Mumbled something about Barbara. And then just after they gave him the shot, he said over and over, Don't be a fool, bud. Don't do it, bud. He did, huh? Well, that's something. Is it? Sure is. Thanks, Sergeant. I'll call you back. What did they say about Clint? Well, it looks like we're looking for a murderer now. Take it oh. easy, honey. We had one break, though. Clint. It'll interest you, bud. Will it? The police know who shot him. Clint told them. Bud, <laughs> what are you doing? Just protecting myself, Barbara. You want to use that gun now, Marlo? I'm keeping her right here in front of me. Yeah, I see you. I thought you'd have a 38, bud. That kind of clinches it, doesn't it? Not yet, it doesn't. Bud, please, don't. Stand still and shut up. Drop your gun, Marlo. Let it go, kid, and we'll talk about this. You won't get hurt unless you hurt her. Drop your gun. Bud, someone's coming. Mr. Marlo. Look out, you two. Oh, my. <laughs> Thanks for the souvenir, bud. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. Good work, Mr. Marlo. Barbara, <laughs> honey, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right, Mrs. How about that, Mr. Larry? Coming in when you did, you're nothing but a bloody hero. Oh, my. I feel so. Hmm. Good Lord, there he goes again. Lucille was a past master at reviving him by now. She hauled him sack style over to the couch while I told Barbara her Clint was going to be okay. I kept Bud immobilized until the squat little sergeant arrived with a squad car. They hauled him away. I dug the 38 slug out of the plaster and gave it to the sergeant. When the show was over, Mr. Larry obligingly snapped too. You feel like walking, Mr. Larry. I could carry you to our, your bungalow, you know. Oh, mercy no, Lucille, I'll walk. If you'll just let me use your arm for support. You're just welcome to it, I'm sure. <laughs> Can I help? Well, no thanks so much, Mr. Marlowe. We'll manage. You give Mr. Rogers my best, Barbara. I will. I'll be glad to. You know, Lucille, I'm beginning to see the value in the love and protection of a strong woman. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> She'd be good for him, too. Yeah. Now, look, honey, what's this all about? You've been looking for something, so has Bud, apparently. Clint got himself shot because of it. Now, what is it? Bud said it was money, that Clint had some hidden here in the house. Oh? I didn't believe it. Still, there, there was something between Clint and me. Something he wouldn't tell me. Whatever it was, it's, it's kept us from getting married. What was Bud's story? Well, you see, Bud's known Clint a long time. He just came out here a couple of months ago from Ohio. Clint didn't seem to want us to get acquainted, Bud and me. It wasn't jealousy. It was something else I couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. Last week, Bud told me that Clint had robbed some store back east. That he'd been caught and, and served some time but they'd never found the money, and that, that Clint somehow escaped from prison, came out here, and brought the money with him. Well, it could be. Clint caught Bud looking for something here tonight. By the way, where'd you run into Bud tonight? Oh, just about a block or two from here at the mm. corner. I was driving home from a movie. 
I decided to come up here for one more look before Clint got home. I... I insisted that Bud come with me. He didn't want to. Now, let's see what we can find. No one's opened that little trap door in the hall closet yet. Maybe that's got all the answers. <laughs> It's a strong box, isn't it? Yeah, it's not very heavy, though. Yeah. There. Let's see now. No. no money at all. A couple of war bonds made out to Clinton Rogers and or Thomas Rogers. Clint said he didn't have any family. Hey, look, look. Here's an envelope with your name on it. Oh? Uh, for Barbara Curtis to be opened in case of my death. I don't know what to do. Well, don't look at me, honey. I can't decide for you. You, well, you will go with me when I tell him, though, won't you? Sure, I will. Let's see. My darling, this newspaper clipping will tell you why I couldn't marry you. When you read it, you'll see why. I love you, Clint. I'm afraid to read the clipping, Mr. Marlowe. Let me see it. Not pretty, honey, but it isn't about Clint. But then who... It's about Thomas Rogers, who at the age of 16 murdered his father and mother. The story says he escaped from the Ohio Asylum for the Insane in June of this year. Officials think he may attempt to contact his brother Clinton in California. And Bud is... Yeah, it's his picture with the story. Oh, Clint. Poor Clint. What a horrible, horrible thing for him to live with. Yeah. But honey, Mr. Larry said it a little while ago. The love and protection of a strong woman? Clint has it, Mr. Marlowe. I've never been so strong or so protective, and I've never loved so much. It was almost dawn now. I drove Barbara over to the hospital in Clint. We didn't say anything. There wasn't anything to say. Nice girl, that Barbara. All woman. You know, I never could understand the guys who pronounce woman as wool man. <laughs> what would we be without them, huh? Oh, they have their faults, but what would they be without them? Yeah, truly it's been said, there's nothing like a dame. <laughs> Wonder what Rita's doing tonight. <laughs> The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, starring Gerald Moore, was produced and directed by Cliff Howell and written for radio by Kathleen Hyde. The cast included D.J. Thompson, Olin Soule, Ted Osborne, Frank Gerstle, Arthur Q. Bryan, Shirley Mitchell, and William Tracy. Gerald Moore may currently be seen in the Santana production, Sirocco. The special music for Philip Marlowe is composed by Pierre Garagank and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Now, here again is the star of our show, Gerald Moore. Thanks, Roy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tonight's broadcast concludes our current series of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. I understand it won't be very long until we meet again. So until we do, we won't say goodbye for just so long. See you soon. I still wonder what Rita's doing tonight. Lovable, laughable, my friend Irma, starring blonde Marie Wilson, is back on CBS Radio Sunday evenings now. She'll move in tomorrow night at most of these same CBS radio stations, bringing her skeptical roommate, Jane, her permanently jobless boyfriend, Elle, Professor Kropotkin, and all the others. Be listening for My Friend Irma tomorrow night, won't you? That address again? Why, sure. CBS, CBS, the star's address, the star's address, where you always hear the best at CBS, CBS, the star's address, the star's address, CBS. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. And remember, Steve Allen is here with songs for sale every Saturday on CBS Radio. Roy Rowan speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>